It is Thursday, November 5th, 2020, and I am Bonnie Lo Craman, and I am here with a very special guest. Jeremy Spake is joining me today from Seattle, Washington. I am here at my home office in Ponte Vedra, Florida, and we're here to talk about the article we co-wrote together called, How is HR Really Deciding How Much to Pay You? And wow, has it came out of about a month ago and it's really been causing quite a stir. The link for the whole article is down below in the description. So you can click on it and hit pause and whatever you want to do. So we welcome all of our listeners from all over the world. Uh, Jeremy Spake is a, is a principal consultant at a company called Cornerstone On Demand um, on the West Coast, and he can tell us more about the company. And he is a compensation expert. That's how I first came to reach out to Jeremy, because uh, those of you who have followed me know that I'm very involved in the land of executive and personal assistance. I've been speaking and teaching in 14 countries and I'm up to 38 states at the moment. Uh, to, uh, COVID has put a little damper on the travel, but needless to say, since March, I've been in contact with assistance through you know, our webinars from all over the world. And what I've come to know is that the subject of money has been shrouded in silence and the forbidden and it's secret and we've gotten the, the message that we shouldn't talk about money. And yet at the same time, it is the one of the most burning subjects at the front of most people's minds. You know, when I ask uh, you know, rooms of people on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the most, how stressful is the subject of money what comes back to me, Jeremy, I'm sure you're not going to be surprised. It's 10, 12, 20, and sometimes a seven or an eight. So welcome, Jeremy. So happy to have you here with us. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited for the conversation today. Oh, cool. Just briefly tell us a little bit more about what you do and what Cornerstone does and the fill in the blanks that I left open. Yeah, sure. So um, as Bonnie mentioned, I work for a company called Cornerstone On Demand, and we are a talent management software company, meaning we've got solutions for everything for the employee lifecycle, everything from recruiting to how people get managed or evaluated on their performance, how people get assigned you know, training or development and succession planning opportunities, and then ultimately how that translates into how people are paid. So I've been at Cornerstone um, as a consultant with our clients for about five years, but prior to that, I worked in the area of talent management as a comp and performance consultant in a number of corporate environments, but also consulting environments for about 15 years prior. So um, I've been working in the compensation space for a long time, and I kind of fell into it accidentally. I don't think anyone goes to school thinking, I would like to grow up and be a comp person. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I kind of fell into it accidentally. I was in graduate school and I was doing a statistics course and they were looking for part-time um, graduate students to kind of go in and do a comp survey evaluation to kind of you know help mm -hmm. clients understand what the right market data should be for a role. And I never knew anything like this existed. So I started working in this compensation survey house uh, for about six years and ultimately became, kind of became really uh, client facing and helping clients understand how to use compensation data to set accurate market rates and salary structures globally. So it's something I kind of fell into, um, but I'm a very data centric person anyway, and I really kind of clicked for me. And then in my first corporate role doing comp, one of the very first um, kind of, I don't know, tasks assigned to me was to work on a pay equity task force. So I've been doing this work since 2009 in the pay equity wor uh -huh. world. And, um, and it really kind of clicked for me because I realized how much disparity there was in the company I was working at alone. And I figured there must be more out there. So I really started to pay attention to this topic because I see, saw how impactful <laughs> it was for employees' lives in the company I worked at. Really cool. Uh, yeah, there's so much here. Well, you know, over the years, as I've been teaching and speaking with assistants, and of course that's, you know, a, a, one profession out of so many in, in different companies, but certainly a significant portion of, of a given company's staff. And they're 95 to 98% female. So 
when you start reading about the wage gap and the difference between what men make and what women make, it becomes really clear that there's a problem to be solved. And as I speak with assistants, so many of them on one hand are the backbone of the company and the right arms to their executives. And on the other hand, they're making pitifully, severely low salaries for the responsibilities that they're holding. So I went on the search for an expert. A colleague uh, fed me to you, Jeremy, and you know, because you and I didn't know each other before last right. year in 2019, but now we both realized that we were both spoke at the SHRM conference uh, called HR Southwest in Fort Worth. Well, we didn't meet each other there, but I heard about you there. And you gave, uh, and at the, the big SHRM conference in Vegas, I came to know that Jeremy spoke about compensation at what they termed a mega conference at, at SHRM. So I wanted to speak with an expert because I was running into such brick walls about, you know, these assistants don't know, A, how to find how much they're worth, how much the role is valued at. And I was like, well, wait, how are HR people figuring that out? And, and I kept thinking, we, we have to expose this idea because the subject of money was so preoccupying people. And I, I can't imagine that there's too many people listening who haven't had at least one time in your life where you were so stretched for money that it became, you know, a very big subject in your brain of, that you're preoccupied, worried about paying your bills. I mean, I've had that. Jeremy, have you? I have, absolutely, yes, for sure. You know, I so we can relate to that issue and the stress level of 10. Um, and I, I came to Jeremy saying, how are HR people deciding how to pay people, especially executive assistants? And as Jeremy and I talked, he cares as, as much as I do about closing this wage gap. Uh, you know, the idea that women are making so much less than men are for the same amount of money. So Jeremy, can you talk about that? And, and I know we both were got very excited about the 60 minutes piece. Uh, that Mark Benioff did in April of 2018. So can you kind of help us there? How, how is it yeah. deciding? Right, well, so um, let's, call, let's uh, rewind about that first job I just told you that I had in the comp world and it was at a survey firm. And that's kind of where I really learned the ins and outs of how people decide how to make an offer. So think about it if you're going to uh, interview for a role and they've given you an offer, which usually comes with some kind of base salary recommendation. Where did that number come from? How did they get that? Where did they where did they derive that number from? Yeah. Well, the answer is um, from a compensation survey house, like my very first job at a company called Culpepper. They're located in Atlanta, and they target really you know technology and life sciences companies. But the idea is the same. So a company will buy this survey, but in order to get the data from the survey, they have to give their own data. So let's say um, Bonnie, I'm your assistant, and you want to think about how much to pay me. Uh, well, how are, you're going to not just gra grab this number out of thin air. Hopefully, you've got data that tells you what the range is from an assistant with a certain number of years of experience or a certain education level in a certain geography. Maybe you want to look at Jacksonville versus Chicago or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you kind of do these different kind of analysis of data cuts to kind of get you at a, 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 an idea or a ballpark range for a role. And then you make that offer based on the role. So most companies will buy surveys like this and participate in surveys like this. So these surveys are very um, robust in terms of the data they collect. The problem though is, Bonnie, as we've discussed, um, I feel like oftentimes the job descriptions that they're using, that a company may be using right. to match in a survey to find out what the range for the job should be are not completely accurate. So uh, if you're looking to hire me as your executive assistant, may maybe, your company did not provide data for that role. So you're not going to get any data. You're going to get just kind of a big bucket of all admin right. assistants. So you're going to see probably um, a much lower pay range than you're expecting just due to the nature of the, um, of the, of the, of the role um, for an executive assistant being so much more um, weighty for lack of a better word. Right. So, you know, as, and it was so exciting speaking with you, Jeremy, because as we spoke, I realized 
oh my goodness, like, what assistants are reporting is that their job descriptions are obsolete. They are right. dated. Some of them from big companies are reporting to me that the job description that HR is putting out are as much as like 10 years old, 15 years old. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what are they asking for? How, how many, you know, can you work a typewriter or whatever? And it seemed like, oh my gosh, we're not dealing with up to the minute information. And in the article, we talk about, you know, the cost of these surveys and that it's a sizable amount of money, depending on the, the, the sample size, the amount of people reporting it. I didn't know about these survey companies that did this work. But the other thing that we came to is that there are executive assistants, but then there was a whole other group, the C-suite executive assistants, and not all surveys have that job family. C-suite executive assistants are the ones in the C-suite, the ones who support the CEOs and the, the high level VPs. And it is such a small subset of the bigger group that what we found is that that smaller subset was being lumped into yes. the lower paid group. And so it was a revelation. And in real life, what that means is that the executive assistants to CEOs who sometimes make 200, 225-ish, you know, $1,000 a year, they're having to maneuver around the fact that the data simply isn't there. And, and it, it's dependent on, you know, uh, CEOs who are willing to go to bat in HR and say, no, 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 we can't lose this person. We're going to figure it out. So it's not based on any hard data. It's based on the whim or the, you know, uh, just the luck of the draw and how, how successful leaders can be making the case about how valuable this particular staffer is. So it was pretty mind blowing stuff. And, you know, I'm experiencing from assistants that they do not feel free to speak about this issue very much. And so when Jeremy started talking about phrases like pay equity and pay transparency, that was so far away from the land of the forbidden and the secret. Can you talk about transparency and equity as, as it was such an exciting concept to me and you know, right up to 2020, there's some exciting things happening right now around it. Not all good, but Jeremy, can you fill us in on, on what does that all mean? Pay equity well, and pay transparency. Yeah, well, I'm gonna actually share with you a little bit of data here. Let me tell you a little bit about what Pay Equity Day is in the first place. So Pay Equity Day is an annual symbolic day mm -hmm. that's meant to represent how far into a year a woman would have to work to make the same equivalent salary as her male counterpart. So this year in 2020, pay, Equal Pay Day was March 31st. So what that means, Bonnie, is let's say you and I have the same exact job, the same salary, the same level of experience, everything, and we start our job on January 1st. Well, let's say our base salary is $100,000 just to make it easy. Then by December 31st, the male in the situation will have, you know, symbolically, or at least kind of looking at the aggregate average data, the male would have made his entire base salary. Well, right. the woman has to work all the way to March 31st of the subsequent year to make that same right. salary. And that just kind of lets us know on average, what the difference is in terms of how much further a woman would have to work um, into the subsequent year than her male counterpart to make the same salary. But that's the average, March 31st. When you add on the intersections of race, there are even right. further disparities that show up. So for example, Asian American women, they have to work until March 5th. So they're doing a little bit better than the national mm -hmm. average. But African American women have to work all the way to August 22nd, Native American women to September 23rd, and Latin American women to November 20th, so almost a full second year. Mm -hmm. So this tells us that there is a huge pronounced pay disparity, not only between genders, but even further exacerbated by the lens of race when you add on that, that, right. um, that, that viewpoint. And they've been collecting this data you know, since 1955, and we've seen it slowly uptick in terms of how much closer the gap gets. So March 31st was equal pay day this year, last year it was April 6th. So it's mm -hmm. gone up about a week, 
of course we want to see it go up you know so there, there is no such thing as equal payday any longer that would be the ideal world but um companies are paying attention to this and they're paying attention to this because employees are at making them so i would say looking thinking back to the job description problem we were talking about a moment ago one of the best things anyone can do in any role to mm -hmm. advocate for themselves is to ask their manager quite simply how are you determining my pay show me the job description that you're matching me to in these surveys that you're buying mm -hmm. and let's make sure it's relevant and it's right and it's valid but also when you when you as my manager bonnie would match me to a job in a survey you also match me to a level so not only is my job correct but is my level correct and i'll just be honest these are the kinds of things that fall through the cracks in hr departments all the time and it's not for malintent it's usually mm -hmm. simply because these are the kinds of really you know in the weeds types of actions a lot that has to require a lot of review a lot of buy-in and a right. lot of work to, to get everybody on board is, is this the right job description is this the right level is this the right data right so it, getting everybody on board with that takes time and just to be honest my experience in some companies has been people take the time and in some companies i've worked for people don't really feel like it's worth right. the time so unless employees make it an issue and I'm going to interrupt you one second because I, the woman, the HR professional who led me to you had such an interesting conversation with her at HR Southwest. And, you know, I, she was very interested in the work I'm doing with EAs. And she said, well, tell me what EAs are saying. And I said, well, you're not going to like it. And she said, well, tell me, I want to know. And I said, well, executive assistants do not feel that HR is for them. They do not feel like you see them, value them, and you're certainly not paying them fairly. And therefore they will do everything to not deal with you. And that they do not feel that you're, uh, that they are a priority for HR at all. And she looked at me and she said, well, I have a message back for the assistants. And I said, bring it on. I told you, you tell me. And she said, tell them, that they're absolutely right. Hmm. Tell them that they're right, that they are not a priority for HR because HR is in the weeds. It is not that we don't want to, it's that the squeaky, that EAs are tend to be very self-sufficient and, and have access to the leaders and they're able to succeed without a lot of guidance and handholding, et cetera, because they are you know, so capable and competent, which is certainly my experience. Uh, that what she shared is that HR is very consumed these days, pre-pandemic, they were very consumed with the whole Me Too, Time's Up, you know, dealing with increased cases of sexual harassment and bullying. And then, then how about the whole initiative to create active shooter plans in companies because of the gun issue, you know, shootings in companies and needing to make the environment safe. So HR has been inundated with projects that are very time consuming. And uh, she said, I have to be honest, the executive assistants are, I can't anticipate that they're ever going to be in the top priorities for HR. And so that was a smack in the face revelation. So I'm, and I'm, I came away thinking, all right, well, what do we do about that then? What do we do? And Jeremy gave me those answers. So what do they do? Jeremy? <laughs> well, I abs well, I absolutely think um, first and foremost that, uh, that, that your HR contact is, is probably, un probably right. It's just not a priority just because of the million of myriad of other things going on. And if you think about it in a large comp company, most likely this is a small population of the overarching employee group. So they're probably focused elsewhere. That doesn't mean that it's not important. And that doesn't mean that we don't want to advocate for pay equity studies. But the good thing is, Bonnie, I think in the last couple of years, Me Too, Time's Up, those movements that you've mentioned have really shown a light on workplace harassment issues, workplace gender disparity. So in my experience, coupling in kind of these ideas around, you know, sexual harassment training and non-discrimination policies and making sure that companies have those all shored up. From my experience with the clients I'm working with, a piece of that is, hey, are we paying men and women correctly and right too? Mm -hmm. Now, not everyone is moving as quickly as, you know, in my world, I would hope them to move, but that's also a function of just the fact that there's a lot of other stuff going on and also a function of price and expense. So if I look under the hood and see there's a huge gender gap in the way I'm paying people, 
I'm legally bound to correct it. If I don't look under the hood, I don't have to correct it. So if I think that there might be a huge gap that will cost me a lot of money to fix and repair, I might just not look at it for a little while. Mm -hmm. And especially in the pandemic, when people are tightening their purse strings yeah. and trying to shore up um, how much they're spending, uh, this would likely be not a priority. So it's, yeah, it's complicated what's happening right now. Uh, assistants are reporting back that in this pandemic, some companies have asked people to take 20% pay cuts across the board. And indeed, right. you know, everybody knows the feeling about, you know, acting in an emergency and, you know, we've got to do whatever it takes. We have to pull together and, and, you know, keep the companies afloat. Well, now we're seven, eight months into this pandemic. What this article has done is, is to be able to tell assistants that they may have had to take a pay cut. And they might still be living with that, but it doesn't stop them from having a conversation about pay, about future pay and their level of responsibility and what might the future hold with salary and compensation. And that's the thing that women in general are not trained to do. Uh, and, and that in part was one of the goals of the article was to offer a roadmap for having that conversation. And, and I think we've done that. Well, I hope so. And, you know, I think that I don't want to sound, I, what I want to sound is really hopeful because a lot of also um, kind of movement that we're seeing culturally in an organization specifically that I work with. Uh, but I mean, if you look at any um, article, uh, you know, articles out there from SHRM or the Harvard Business Review around organizations in general, you know what everyone's paying attention to right now, particularly since the summer, what? their diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives at oh, all course. organizations. And a big piece of diversity, equity, inclusion means mitigating, of course, things like unconscious bias and how people are yeah. evaluated and reviewed for their performance reviews, which, by the way, translates directly into their pay. Right. So people are really shining a light on things like how unconscious bias shows up in aspects of talent management in reviews, for example. And if I, if I give you a terrible review, you're not going to get singled out for any kind of mm -hmm. career advancement or leadership training or certainly not get any pay. So people are really taking a look at all of their processes and the outcome to so many of those processes equals how much you're gonna get paid or rewarded or your increase would be for the year. So right now is a really great time to raise your hand and say, we need to be pay attention to pay equity as part of this bigger diversity, equity, inclusion initiative. Right, and could you talk about the Mark Benioff piece in 60 Minutes and what did that trigger? Yeah, sure. I mean, I really love this piece and I know you did too. Yeah. So Mark Benioff, um, he is, for those of you who don't know, he's the CEO of Salesforce, a massive tech company based in the Bay Area. Right. Um, and uh, so they had been given, but from Fortune Magazine, the number one best place to work in the US for I think five years in a row or something, they'd gotten mm -hmm. this award. So 60 Minutes comes to them and they want to do kind of a piece on their culture. And the CHRO says to Mark Benioff, she says, you know, I think we should do a pay equity study here at Salesforce. Just make sure we're paying men and women equally for all other intents and purposes. And he says, oh, you don't even need to do that. Don't even bother. We have made promoting and retaining women and having executive leadership represented um, by women a priority here at Salesforce. This is part of our cultural fabric. We have absolutely made this a priority. So he, in the piece, he says, and I quote something like, um, we don't play shenanigans with people's pay here. So don't even bar, don't even worry about it. You don't even have to look at it. And so the CHRO says, uh -huh, I know better, right? So I'm gonna take, I'm gonna push back. And she says, what we can do is just take a look under the hood and see if we're practicing what we preach. Right. They did that, found out there was a $20 million gap in how they're paying men and women. So what I'm trying to say is even a company that thinks they're pulling all the right levers. They're the number one best place to work. Their CEO has the message mm -hmm. from the top. All of these things are operationalized down the filter, so to speak, by people. And people making decisions about other people are always gonna have some you know, areas for consternation or bias to show up in some way. And what they found was sure enough, their ideals were not being operationalized down by every manager. Right. So they had a $20 million gap that they had to put, a, and you know, they've got plenty of money. They put a price tag on it, fixed it, done. Most companies will not be able to do that, which I guarantee you is probably why most people don't look at this issue in the first place. Uh, it's complicated. And Jeremy and I are not 
out to oversimplify, but I, you know, I, I asked him, for example, and this is in the article, you know, I was under the assumption that HR people were going to the Department of Labor for, for data. And of course, Jeremy confirmed that that's not happening at all. And, and there's all this data around survey companies and crowdsourcing um, sites like Glassdoor and Indeed and salary.com. And what's the problem with those crowdsourcing sites, Jeremy? So I, yeah, I think the crowdsourcing sites um, in many ways are a good thing, but we have to take them with a little bit of a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. And here's why. So just like Yelp, and so if you're familiar with these crowd size stores, it's just kind of like Yelp. You can go out and anyone can put a review out there of anything. So I could go out to PayScale or PayFactors or Glassdoor or any of these sites and say, I'm a physicist living in Houston, Texas. Here's my salary. No one's going to verify this, right? So keep in mind that some of the data that goes into these data yeah. sets, um, it's not verified. Um, and the idea, of course, is that most, most of the data over time will uh, kind of, you know, built around and their algorithms are very sophisticated. So they're ruling out kind of extraneous stuff. But at the end of the day, um, I'll just say, use that data with a grain of salt. But the good thing is I could go out there today and say, uh, you know, I'm an executive assistant in New York and my experience, my experience level is X and my education level is Y and my current salary is, you know, ABC. Um, and I'll get some kind of good ballpark picture of what my salary range should be. Now it may not be the salary range I actually get, and that's because some of the data may not be correct, right? Or internally at the company I work for, they use a different source of data. So the good thing is if you as an employee go out to one of these sites, get this data, look at your, come, come to the conversation with HR or your manager or a compensation person at your company, and you've got some crowdsourced data that you've got, right. you've got a job description in your hand about what your job is, and you can say, hey, let's have a conversation about how my salary is different from what I'm seeing here. Right. And I can tell you that since this article came out, and I've been talking about this prior to that, you know, in order to bring the data, bring the data, your actual job description, the research that you do by meeting with local recruiters or, you know, going to these crowdsourcing sites, which do provide easy access to the data, HR directors and professionals, they're finally listening. Uh, you, this article has made a lot of waves because you know the Mark Benioff piece from 60 Minutes came out in April of 2018. That isn't that long ago. And, and uh, Jeremy, you spoke at the Sherm conference and you had more than a thousand people in the room and you're talking about comp and pay transparency and pay equity. Can you talk about the the what happened as a result of that did you see some action among hr folks who were thinking ah oh, well that makes a whole lot of sense <laughs> well i do think that as a result of those movements you mentioned me too times up that people are paying more and more attention but also it's kind of an interesting confluence of events so that mark benioff piece you're talking about um came out right around a lot of state and local legislation happening to ban asking about salary history. Right, right. So, so uh, just to kind of give a little bit of explanation around this, let's say I'm a manager and I've got two candidates in front of me I'm going to hire for uh, a role on my team. Um, and one's a man, one's a woman. And uh, let's say I'm looking at their resumes and you know what, I've interviewed them both. They're both equal candidates. I've got no real preference. Um, but I know that the role is worth $100,000 on the market. Let's just say that to be easy. And the comp department at my company has told me you know, we think the role is worth 100,000 and I've got a budget for 100,000. So I'm gonna make an offer to one of these two candidates. So I'm gonna ask both of these candidates, hey, what was your previous salary? Let's say the woman says her previous salary was 80,000. The man says 90,000, okay? Well, so I know the market rate is 100. So they're both being paid below market. But what am I probably gonna do as a manager? Most likely I'm gonna go with the woman. Why? Cheaper, same, same talent. Right. So I may think as a manager, I've done the right thing. I've saved the company money. I've got um, a great new talent on board who's being paid mm -hmm. less than I had the budget for. So what have I done, though? What I, what I have done is propagate a pay disparity. So that's, right. they're both they're both paid low in the first place. 
Um, so if I'm going to make an offer to this woman, what I'm going to do is probably make her an offer with some kind of increase, because usually that's what happens when you change jobs, you get some type of increase. So let's say I'm going to give her 85 as her new base salary. Okay, so she thinks, great, I've got an increase, I've got a new job, all is well. But what she doesn't know is I've got this piece of data that tells me her job is worth 100 on the market, and I'm going to still continue to pay her lower than she's worth. So there's all this legislation that's happened in 17 states now that tells me now as a manager, I cannot ask these two candidates what their previous salary was. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I've got the man and woman in front of me. They're both equal in my eyes. I've got $100,000 to play with. I don't ask them what their previous salary was because I'm not legally supposed to. So now I just have to make a decision based on other factors that don't include money. Right. So that's the ideal way that that legislation should work. But I think we both know that that's not exactly the truth, because what I'm probably going to do as a manager is going to ask you, what's your salary expectation? This is how I'd get around this. Yeah. So what I, would, what I would advise people and candidates to do in situations like that is first and foremost, look at the crowdsource sites to kind of get an idea of the ballpark range you should be looking at. Right. But also when someone asks you that question, if you've got data, you can say, well, I know exactly how much the job is worth on the market because I've done my homework. So right. I'd like to hear your offer. And I think that's an interesting kind of way to put that question back on um, the people that you're interviewing right. with. Yes, because job description equals money. The responsibility, exactly. your experience, your skills, the, the tasks you're going to be asked to do. And so that's the response. It's about evaluating the job description and the time it's going to take to do it based on the geographic area that is going to dictate amounts of money. And, you know, what the data is clear to show, you know, I actually have had colleagues say to me, oh, Bonnie, it's dangerous what you and Jeremy are doing. Dangerous <laughs> to advocate, you know, people to, you know, go for more money, the money, the, the fair money, I'm not ever advocating being greedy. I'm advocating fair. And here's the thing, the data, and Jeremy, I know you'll um, have something to say about this. The data is clear that if you pay people fairly and they're not preoccupied with putting food on the table and making ends meet and they're being paid market value for their role, that, in that increases productivity. It increases employee retention. It increases employee morale. And it increases profits. So mm -hmm. on one hand, we're saying, yes, companies need to pay the $100,000, not 85. The result of that, the data bears out, is that when people are paid fairly, that, that they'll end up, the company will end up being more profitable. What do you, you think? Are you are exactly right. And I'm going to focus in on the, the thing that you said, employee morale as being the primary driver here. And so we can call employee mor morale, employee engagement, uh, whatever term you want to yeah. use. But data tells us, like you said, Bonnie, time and time again, I mean, I've got stats from Deloitte, from the Harvard Business Review, from McKinsey, uh, from Gallup, who has been collecting employee engagement data since 1955. So they have a huge swath of data. Um, and all of these you know, big, huge, robust data sets tell us, you know what drives people's productivity? Employee engagement. You know what drives employee engagement? Being treated fairly and having mm -hmm. equal access to development resources and right. having equal access to all the resources of your organization, meaning I'm also feeling like I'm being paid fairly. So if I feel like I've got equal access to resources in my organization, I'm being paid fairly, my engagement and my morale is up because I feel right. included and belong, like I belong, that drives my productivity that drives my customer satisfaction if I'm a client-facing person. Right. But overall, it drives the bottom line of an organization. There is a strong correlation between employee engagement and fiscal health of an organization. And yeah. if you don't have good employee engagement, your bottom line is going to suffer. Right. So the metric, the metric that you can look at to see how a company is doing is their employee retention rates. Are they keeping people? People don't stay at companies if they're not being treated fairly and respectfully. They are very busy looking for their exit strategy. So those companies, those departments that have revolving doors of staff, there's a reason for that. There's a really important reason for that. You know, I'm a big advocate of finding people who either have worked at a company or are still working at a company to see what is it really like. There is often a big disconnect between what a company, the verbiage that they put on the website 
you know, the propaganda, the promotion versus right. what is it really like? Are they burning people out? Are they killing them? And boy, oh boy, do I get earfuls around that. Um, so there's there's a difference between um, the, 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 the picture companies are painting versus the reality. Uh, we must do a better job at, at finding out what the truth is about what's going on. And that's what this article is all about. So um, Jeremy, where are we now in 2020 around these issues of pay equity and pay transparency? We're in the middle of a pandemic. Lots of places are still locked down, not only in the United States, but globally, but uh, yeah, globally and internationally. Can you talk a bit about, you know, what, what people should be thinking and keeping in mind about money? Yeah, so um, interesting question that's going to be a long-winded answer and rather nuanced. So I do think from my experience with the clients that I'm working with in my role at Cornerstone, you've really got kind of two big buckets of companies, the first of which are companies who are trying to tighten their purse strings and really kind of shore up for economic disruption and just trying to make sure that they can kind of maintain themselves afloat. Then the second bucket, you've got companies who are booming. Uh, Amazon, for example, a lot of tech companies are booming. Yes. So it's kind of a diff, it's kind of a very, it's kind of got a little bit of a half and half kind of world. So I, in the companies that I think might be struggling right now, um, that doesn't mean that these issues are any less important. And the reason I say that is because particularly since the summer, um, when we had a lot of activity around Black Lives Matter, for example, there was a 3000% increase in job postings for diversity, equity and inclusion officers here in the United States. This means that companies are perking up and paying attention to issues around diversity, equity and inclusion. One of those primary drivers around equity is pay. So right now, regardless of kind of the situation that your company may find itself in, is are they are you booming or are you kind of you know take you know taking stock and making sure that you can sustain yourself? Right now is a time to be actively doing all of these kinds of exercises because when the economy quote unquote returns to normal, you want to retain your best people, and if you don't treat your best people fairly, they're going to go elsewhere. Right. Wow. So Jeremy, do you have any last burning thoughts, uh, things that you want to share with our audience about money and anything well, I would that's just on say, your mind? <laughs> well, thank you. I would just say, this is a topic that I find very um, near and dear to my heart. And it's one that I'm really closely invested in. And I think that the, my experience is when um, I've seen employees advocate for themselves with exactly what you described, Bonnie, having a really solid job description that's really applicable mm -hmm. to their role, right. armed with some type of data, and then advocate for you know, a pay review. Um, it's kind of inspiring, to be frank. And, and so while I know maybe um, many people find this intimidating to do kind of on a one-off basis, uh, this is a great thing to do for an entire group of people. So if you've got a lot of ex assistance in, in, in your organization, get together and advocate together collectively. It'll make a more powerful case. Um, and also, you know, the, the more data you've got, the better. There's a great data out there. Companies are paying attention to this primarily because of um, the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives people are taking on since the summer. Um, I think in re response yeah. to a lot of kind of social unrest, but also the legislation that's out there that's happening. Mark Benioff, kind of the CEO of Salesforce standing up and saying, hey, we took a look at this and we didn't do as good as we thought we did and we're going right. to fix it. That's a powerful driver. And so arm yourself with as much information and examples like that. Um, and I think you have a powerful case that pay equity um, is something that can no longer be ignored. Right. And thank goodness. Thank goodness that's the case. And we need to, women in general, but both men and women need to be more open about speaking about money, that it can't be this taboo subject anymore. So it below, you'll see the link for the article and you'll see the link for the 60 minutes piece. All of this is designed to give you great ammunition to go to your leaders with a fact-based case in order to finally make the money you deserve, not only now, but how about next year and the year after? We need to do a better job, in my view, of teaching one another how to negotiate salary from the very beginning. Because of course, whatever you're making in any given year impacts what you make 
what you will earn next year and the year after and the year after. We, we need to become more comfortable in speaking about this subject, which, you know, there's pitifully a, a lack of training on. So. And Bonnie, anyway. I'll just close with one other thing and say, um, I think it's always important to leave an organization better than you found it. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a formalized kind of job family for the, the, your role or a formalized job description, get that in place and have that salary review and that salary structure developed now, not only for yourself, but that it's formalized and embedded in for, for the future too. I couldn't agree more. And Jeremy, one of the traditions we have at the podcast, I didn't warn you about this ahead of time, is to share, if, you, if one comes to mind, share one of your favorite quotes. Do you have okay. one, a philosophy uh, or something? So actually, I think this is completely, uh, I, the one that came to my mind is the, my, my quote I live by, you're going to laugh at this, but I'm a huge fan of Madonna. Uh, and one of the biggest quotes that, that drove, I think, a ph big philosophy for me when I heard it when I was young was I remember her saying um, in the 80s, her saying something like, well, people think because I'm a woman that I'm going to just roll over, but I, people don't get what they don't ask for. And I always make it a point to say what I want. And I just love that idea. Wow. And I, I love that idea too. Yay, Madonna. And in my head, I'm wondering, I wonder who, who helped her come to that. I wonder who taught her that. I, you know, right. that's the question I would ask her. Is it her, was it her mother, her grandmother or father or whatever, but that's great. Yeah. You don't get, if you don't ask, you that's don't get what you don't ask for mm -hmm. and express yourself. It, and, and women don't have a long history of being comfortable asking but that's why it's so important to put it in writing because that document, those documents will do the talking for you in part, do the research, put it in writing. And, uh, and I'm here to tell you that the success stories are pouring in about ass assistants anyway, who have made their case and they are doing what we're advocating and they're getting what they ask for. Usually they get exactly the number that you ask for. So go for fair. And uh, you know what? We'll be leaving a great legacy behind, Jeremy, if we can get, get this thing to fair and close this wage gap, right? Yes, and definitely ask. Big time. Great. Thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you, Bonnie. I appreciate it.